what is cinema? Um, for me, there's only one answer. Cinema is necessary. Martin Scorsese is, I think, one of the best of the best. He really is one of the quintessential American directors. He's somebody that all filmmakers look to as a master of the art. Scorsese has become almost this curator of America's film archive. There's, there, there's almost no film that Scorsese doesn't have a print of. What's so interesting about Scorsese's Mafia pictures is that, you know, for us, <laughs> the idea of a, the Mafia and the, the Mafia life is very exotic. But what we forget is that for Martin Scorsese, he was growing up in Little Italy. These movies are about his life and his experience. Right? And that's partially what has made them so good because there's an authenticity there that no one else could really recreate. It would have been an easy option for the young Martin Scorsese to join the mob and pursue the life of crime that's so often depicted in his films. However, severe asthma kept him away from living a normal life. So he was just kind of staying at home a lot, probably peering out the window, like looking at these mafiosos going around their business, being like, Hey, Taroni, that big shot bullet gonna shoot square with us? His family was surrounded by the mob. These people were often friends, neighbors, and sometimes even family. They'd come for dinner one night and go missing the next. But growing up, Scorsese and his parents embraced a quieter, family-oriented lifestyle. My parents, you know, were working class people who never had, we never had a book in the house. No books. Just the Daily News and the Daily Mirror in New York. Newspapers. And, uh, you know, uh, I mean, he, he took me to movies, my father, basically. That's how he was exposed to all of these greats of the golden age of cinema, directors like William Wyler, who I think he always admired just because of the, the diversity of what he was making. And you see that a little bit in Scorsese's career. Like he's a pretty like diverse guy. I know we like to think of him as the Goodfellas man, but he's dipped his toe in a lot of different genres. So maybe his movies are a way of imagining what his life could have been. Growing up in and around New York, Scorsese not only went to film school, he actually taught at film school. He taught at NYU at the end of the 1960s. But Scorsese, right from the very beginning, was ambitious to make it in Hollywood. 
He went to Los Angeles in the early 1970s. He went as a film editor in the first instance, just keen to get a foot in the door, really. Uh, and from there, he hooked up with a lot of the new Hollywood movie brats who started hanging out with each other in various houses and locations around Los Angeles as they tried to plot their way into the industry. And from there, began touting round his script for Mean Streets, which he'd already written at NYU. Mean Streets was really, I, I think, the first outing of the Scorsese that we know. It, it talked about, you know, rage of young men. It, it painted New York as this dirty, gritty, difficult place. Mean Streets it has that archetype of the guy who gets involved in the criminal world and he, he chases the high and then there's a conflict and then that summons the downfall. And obviously if you look at everything Scorsese made afterwards, that theme just keeps coming up again and again. And, and so I think a lot of the success of Mean Streets and the doors that it opened for Scorsese just came to that, that little recognition of, oh, Okay, he, he sort of found himself in cinema. So Scorsese wasn't actually the first one to work with Robert De Niro. It was Brian De Palma who actually discovered him and worked with him on two films and sort of introduced him to Scorsese and said, hey, look at this great actor. You know, he's young and he's got this sort of like very masculine anger and vulnerability to him, which is so perfect for everything that Scorsese does. And I think they, they, there's something about it that just clicked. De Niro and myself, Bob, we worked on so many films together that we were like, we grew together creatively. Like we grew up together in the same, in the business in a way. Mm -hmm. So we didn't think of each other as stars and, uh, and that sort of thing. Sometimes when directors find actors that really just speak speak their mind through their characters. And I think for De Niro, that, that's so true. He captures everything of that, that Scorsese rise and downfall structure, like in one guy. And that guy is Robert De Niro. I mean, they've been making films together for decades. They have a shorthand and they have a sensibility that's the same in terms of what they want from a character. They both want to get really deep inside a character and, and why they behave the way they do, and De Niro is extremely good at that. I don't think De Niro is better directed by anybody but Scorsese. Three years after the success of Mean Streets, Scorsese and De Niro joined forces again with Taxi Driver, a film that is often highlighted as their best collaboration. De Niro plays Travis Bickle, a disturbed and lonely Vietnam veteran who works as a taxi driver in New York. De Niro's character is drawn to the worst, sleaziest, and most dangerous areas of town, where his clientele includes pimps and prostitutes. Everywhere he goes, he sees violence, degradation, insanity, and filth, which fuels the madness in Bickle's mind. Scorsese himself cameos in the film in one of the darkest moments as a passenger who plans to murder his cheating wife. And I'm going to kill him. Nothing else. I just, I'm gonna kill it. Now, what do you think of that? The appeal of Taxi Driver is, to me, so interesting because it's such a, it's such an unpleasant movie, and there's this sort of like restrict, like gross, like sheen to it, and it's like the pure ugliness of New York City exposed on screen, and yet. At the same time, because Scorsese is such a soulful filmmaker, we get put in this really strange position where we're repulsed by him, but also we empathize with him a little bit. And we're constantly being like tussled between these two extremes of, of the actions that he perpetuates are so immoral and yet what he represents, the sort of the loneliness and the sense of bitterness and feeling forgotten in your own life, like that is something that everyone can associate with. You talking to me? 
You talking to me? Mean Streets and Taxi Driver were incredibly visceral and immersive movies that quickly attained that cult status because they seemed very much in line with the way in which the new Hollywood ethos was working. Violent, quite jarring, anti-heroic characters, people on the margins of society, filming really a post-Vietnam society that American audiences coming through into the theatres were beginning to see themselves outside, but they weren't seeing it on screen up until Scorsese's films, I think. They were very, very kind of important and, and, and templates in a way of that alternative scene that Scorsese had, had, had really helped build up since the turn of the 70s. A lot of these, like the movie brat filmmakers, felt so indebted to the studio age, to the films of the 1940s, because that's that's what they grew up on, and that's what inspired their love of movies. So I think a lot of these directors, like Scorsese, have a really great love of musicals, and so his attempt to, to make New York New York was very earnest to me. But the reason that it, it didn't do well, I think, is really down to Star Wars. So Star Wars changed the whole shape of the industry after 1977. Hollywood had been looking for a way back in, in commercial terms of how to make big blockbuster movies that were family orientated, that people were going to see not just once, but actually come out and see again and again. With Star Wars overnight, like, the appetite of the audience changed. And they're like, we only want these, these sort of like sci-fi fantasies, overblown spectacles. And there almost wasn't really a place for something like New York, New York anymore. I think it surprised a lot of the people in that filmmaking group because even George Lucas's wife Marcia at the time said, hey, George, New York, New York is a grown-up person movie. Like, you have made a little, like, child's movie with Star Wars. I don't think that's going to work. Like, New York, New York, that's a movie. And then obviously the opposite happens and everyone goes, oh, <laughs> I guess the movies have changed. What do you think sets this film aside from all the other science fiction films there are? Publicity. Publicity, certainly, yes. <laughs> Publicity, it's the thing to do to go and see Star Wars, so we're all here doing the thing to do. Books, records, comics, figurines, all followed. Uh, and before Star Wars knew it, it had become a multi-million dollar industry of its own right, really. Scorsese, I think, was already struggling a little bit, even during the making of New York, New York. He's pretty deep into a cocaine addiction, and the failure of this movie that he had put a lot of heart and soul into just made everything so much worse. It pushed him deeper into the spiral. <laughs> Eventually, he was hospitalized at age 35 because of, of his addiction and also his asthma and several other prescription drugs had all just collided into this one sort of terrible incident. Scorsese was kept in the hospital for 10 days and nights. As he lay on his bed, he was able to reflect on both his place in life and in the new era of cinema. Obviously, Scorsese, Spielberg, Lucas, you know, they, they were all kind of part of the same group. They all came up through the ranks together. But there was, I guess, this definite split that happened where 
Spielberg and Lucas had the ability to adapt to this changing landscape and also create the, the changing landscape. But that was just not something that Scorsese could ever adapt to. I think he was very upfront with saying, look, I appreciate what these guys are doing. I'm not filming things in front of a blue screen. That's not my vibe. <laughs> that's, that's not how I want to make movies. And, you know, I think you can look at Raging Bull and go, there's so much darkness here. There's so much complexity. There's so, so much ugliness that that was never going to be the kind of film that America was flocking to see. I thought it was the end of my career, that film. Yeah. I, I, didn't, think, I didn't think so. I, quite honestly, I knew for De Niro it was going to be fine because Bob would get his award. I knew he was such a wonderful actor and he'd get his Academy Award, but I thought I, I was going to go off to Italy and do films on saints. Scorsese really wasn't interested in making Raging Bull. It was a project that De Niro had brought to him, and De Niro was very interested in. And Scorsese had gone, mm, I'm, not, I'm not really into this boxing thing. I don't get the character. But while he was on his hospital bed, De Niro came to visit him and repitched the idea and said, are you going to be one of these directors that just makes like two good movies and then that's it? Or are you going to be here forever? And I think that was the little pep talk that got Scorsese to the place he needed to be to make Raging Bull. And also, I think, to see himself and Jake LaMotta a little bit more. I know, don't forget this man's job, basically, is to go to work in the morning, and go into a ring and get beaten up and beat up by the people, and then come home. <laughs> I mean, in a sense, he's a metaphor for all of us uh, and the psychological and, and, uh, and, and uh, emotional pummeling that we take in our lives. And he, he, he eventually, he eventually, um, he eventually is so, he becomes so negative a character that he, he cuts off everyone around him and including himself from his own soul until finally at the end he goes to his own sort of redemption and is able to get at least a couple of, mo at least one moment in his life where he's at peace with himself at the end uh, when he's in front of the mirror. You don't understand. I could have had class. I could have been a contender. I could have been somebody instead of a bum, which is what I am. With films like New York, New York, Raging Bull, you could tell they were sort of his films. But here he was dealing in, you know, jazz music history, boxing. You know, these were, it was a very different kind of scene in many ways from uh, the things that he first started on. As Scorsese had predicted, De Niro went on to win the Best Actor Academy Award for his performance in Raging Bull. Galvanized by the way the film was received critically, Scorsese decided against retiring to Italy and began work on his next project, The King of Comedy. Once again, he cast De Niro in the main role, and this time alongside comedian Jerry Lewis. King of Comedy, out of all Scorsese's films, is maybe the one that really felt unappreciated in its time because Again, it was a film I'm not sure Scorsese really wanted to make that much, but De Niro was very excited about the prospect. Scorsese was more interested in going off to make The Last Temptation of Christ, and he wanted De Niro to do it. And De Niro was like, mm, I'm not really into this. Here's a script for a comedy that I'd actually really love to do. And again, managed to convince Scorsese to make it. And there was something about, I think again, the harshness of, of King of Comedy, the awkwardness of the humor, it's such, it's such an, an uncomfortable movie to watch. And so, uh, no, the film was uh, completely ignored. Um, it actually had gotten some fairly decent reviews, good reviews and major papers here, but um, the film was completely uh, uh, reviled, reviled. Uh, it was uh, appreciated, I think it opened the Cannes Festival, it was appreciated there. But other than that, the film was just put away for years. Maybe just something about the era it was released in or the feeling of the time people just were not ready for it. And it's only now that you can have a movie like Joker come in and essentially just, you know, replicate the whole thing and audiences laugh it up and it makes a billion dollars at the box office. I find that, I find that really interesting. Gerald, good seeing you. Jerry, go get up. Ah, oh, boy, I'll tell you. 
Well, that was quite an entrance. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jerry, I love this guy. Always coming up with these great lines. I love him. I love him. He's wonderful. You're wonderful. I, you, I don't know what I'd do without you. Well, that makes one of us. <laughs> So there's a point after King of Comedy where it again felt like Martin Scorsese was ready to make The Last Temptation of Christ. It was a book that he'd actually been given all the way back when he was making Boxcar Bertha by Barbara Hershey, who said, I'm going to give you this book. I think one day you should make it into a movie, but just promise me that you will cast me in it. And Scorsese said, OK. <laughs> and he fell in love with this book, and it was sort of simmering underneath every project he made since. You know, just this, oh, one day I'm going to make The Last Temptation of Christ. And after King Comedy, it really seemed like it was going to happen. Everyone was ready to go, ready to start filming, and the studio phoned him up on Thanksgiving Day and said, Marty, we're pulling the movie. So Scorsese was, was devastated, obviously, and I think he retreated a little bit into making After Hours, which was a very sort of low budget, almost off the cuff, very raw movie. That was moderately successful. And then it finally came time to make The Last Temptation of Christ. And the only way he could pull it off was by promising the studio that he would make them a second very commercial picture, which was Cape Fear. But even then, you know, it was, it was problem after problem, and it, it's sort of a miracle that the movie got made. Yeah, movie hell. Everything that could possibly go wrong, you know, goes wrong. Like what? Well, hailstones, uh, roads being washed out, uh, Arabic extras that uh, for a long period of time don't understand what you're trying to tell them because you don't speak the language, and of course you, you know, naturally you have Arabic um, uh, second ADs mm -hmm. too, assistant directors, but it does take a little while to get going. It take, takes a little while to get going. But it's very clear that throughout his whole life, he's really been, I think, trying to answer a question about his own faith. For me, it's never been just another film. For me, it was the most important film I've ever, I've ever had to make. And uh, uh, it's very important for me, this movie. I mean, because of my religious background, because of the fact I wanted to be a priest, because of the fact that, in a sense, the church has never left me and I've never left it in that sense, even though I'm a lapsed Catholic, I'm not a Catholic who's practicing Catholic, but, uh, uh, I still, I still think about it. I still think about my relationship to God and uh, the idea of the sacrament of the mass, the, the Catholic uh, Catholic uh, attitude of, uh, towards uh, towards uh, Jesus and and God, the divinity of Jesus and uh, being fully human and fully divine and one entity and all these incredible heresies of the past two thousand years and all of this uh, just part of my life. You see, you want to know who my God is? Fear. You look inside me and that's all you'll find. But the more devils that we have inside of us, the more of a chance we have to repent. Lucifer is inside me. People have uh, talked a lot about the controversy about this film and we've touched on it here. Is it, is it valid, the people, the uh, you know, fundamentalists that are saying, it's wrong, it's wrong, don't go see it? Well, I think in terms of fundamentalists, you have to understand that people who, who are called fundamentalists are people who believe in the word of the gospel, and you can't detract one iota from those words. Uh, any, anything else, any, anything other than the facts that are written in the gospel would be, uh, to say the Heresy. least, inappropriate, you know, if not sinful, if not blasphemous. And so I understand from their point of view that it would be a problem for them to uh, participate in viewing of this film. Um, what I'm saying is that don't give the wrong impression to other people, the other people like myself who, uh, like myself and other people who were raised, very strict Catholics, let's say, and other, other Christians who were raised on the, on the truth of the Gospels, but also were able to interpret the Gospels and discuss and use uh, parables in the Gospels or stories or, or incidents in Jesus' life that are given us in the Gospels as, as, um, as starting off points for a discussion and to make up stories and to uh, argue. And, uh, and so you can learn a little more. That's all a question. You might get an answer, maybe. You know, maybe an answer. People started getting mad even before the film came out. The script had leaked, and the rumors started to spread that the film was going to include a sequence where Jesus gets down off the cross and goes to live a human life with Mary Magdalene, has kids, has sex, 
lives a full life and dies, and then it turns out to be the devil's temptation. And something about seeing just that, that human aspect of Jesus infuriated a sector of the Catholic Church. I would dismiss it artistically. Um, it contains some of the most um, bizarre and crude imaginings that I have seen. We have black cobras with female seductive voices. We have, for heaven's sake, a talking lion who's supposed to represent part of the temptations of Christ. You have Christ taking out his heart and holding it up before his followers. It's uh, an imagination that has created this film, which is very violent, very crude, and I would have imagined somewhat sick. So that's a lot to fight against. <laughs> and there were protests outside of the studio. There were protests at film festivals. Scorsese had to have a bodyguard. There was an arson attack on a cinema in Paris where 13 people were injured. I again, it's just incredible that this movie was made and, and distributed. But I think really looking back on it now, anyone who watches it, whether you are of faith or of not, you you see that this was a very religious experience for Scorsese. This was a very pure, this was about his own faith. And he was very upfront about that, you know, at the time saying, you know, I made this as a Catholic man. Like, I, this is not blasphemy for me. This is me uh, coming to better understand Jesus. That's, that's, uh, that's what I say to them, to please be more tolerant and understand. They say, they can say, listen, you can't do that with our, our God, but it's my mm -hmm. God too. Undeniably, The Last Temptation of Christ was a controversial film. And I think Scorsese knew that it would probably be controversial. It was a very personal film for him, you know, his own religious upbringing and his own kind of devotion to the church, which features a lot in his films in, in various ways, clearly made this a very, very personal project for him. But he moved on very swiftly from that controversy to Goodfellas at the turn of the 1990s and then further on to Age of Innocence in the early 1990s. Two films that really kind of cemented both his reputation as one of America's great filmmakers, but also perhaps two of his best films of his whole career. Big cops. <laughs> really funny. Really funny. Uh, what do you mean I'm funny? <laughs> it's funny, you know. It's a good story. It's funny. You're a funny guy. <laughs> what do you mean? You mean the way I talk? What? It's just, Goodfellas know. strikes that kind of perfect balance between what's real and what's fantastical because there is such an authenticity to it and a feeling of texture and, and detail, and, and you're so absorbed in the lives of these gangsters. Uh, all things that could only come out of the fact that Scorsese knew this life firsthand. I mean, basically, that was the idea to make the picture, because it wouldn't be any sense of me making another film, because uh, there have been so many great ones made about the rise and fall of the American gangster, uh, whether it's uh, from the Italian-American uh, or uh, Irish-American, in the case of Public Enemy with Jimmy Cagney and many other films, but, or in the case of The Godfather, uh, that very, very strong, uh, uh, almost Greek tragedy of the, uh, the Italian-American family that, that he controls in, that, that, in those films. Uh, in this case, for me, the, 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 the main reason for making it was, was to show a day-to-day -day lifestyle, to do it as accurately as possible. The confidence and energy that he brought to the filmmaking and that it feels just that it feels like you are being shot out of a gun and you are the bullet and you're like traveling through Henry Hill's life and before you know it... Now it's all over. I, I feel like it's been two minutes and this whole movie has happened in front of me. I think it was that just something about that combination meant it felt so different from The Godfather, which was this very sort of... I guess, poetic and almost sort of noble representation of the gangster life. Scorsese came in and just like, like ripped it to shreds. The, the idea was again to show literally what every 
aspect of this lifestyle is like, and the attraction to it, the glamorization of it when you're a child and you see it and you want to be, you want to aspire to that, and then the t being caught and wrapped up in it, uh, and having, in many cases, uh, uh, rewards for being in it, like being able to get a ringside table at a, at a nightclub, um, and uh, people not waiting online to buy bread at the neighborhood bread store, you know. I think that's basically what the film is really about, about people who um, want to aspire not to wait online. And uh, finally, they have to start paying for it, though. They have to start paying for it. No. Obviously, by 1990, he had a pretty incredible body of work already, but there was something about the confidence of Goodfellas and like the, the feeling of energy it brought that excited people. And I think both got studios on his side, critics on his side, audiences on his side. I think everyone was a little bit more ready and like willing to accept what came next. And perhaps that's why Scorsese could then go make things like The Age of Innocence and kind of like go wherever he wanted to go. One of my favorite Scorsese films is The Age of Innocence, his adaptation of Edith Wharton's novel. And in a way, that's a, probably a slightly contrary view because people wouldn't necessarily, if they thought of Scorsese, go to the kind of films where he's taken a sort of left field shift away from traditional subject matter that people would associate him with. But I think The Age of Innocence is just a spectacular film in many ways. He captures the period and time, the late 19th century setting. He captures the manners. He captures the sense of, I think, not only a sense of social framing and a social milieu for East Coast patrician America and the way in which those various constructs of society play out around each other. Well, my old friend Jay Cox, who was a Time Magazine movie critic at the time in the late 60s, we became friends. And he gave, me, he gave me the book in 1980. And he kind of knew, knew me for, very well. And the kind of films that we liked, we liked a lot, very much the same film. And uh, I would introduce him to certain films, he would introduce me to others. And knew that I, I would wanted to make a love story at one point in my career. And knew that I also liked films of this genre, which loosely called costume pieces, but actually this isn't. It's more of a, a story about people, but they be, they're wearing different costumes, okay. Um, and um, he said, this one is you. When, when you get that time to read the book, this one will be the one to make for you, I know it. And uh, he meant the spirit of it. When I first sat down to watch the adaptation, I sort of couldn't believe that Martin Scorsese had made it. I was like, why is the taxi driver guy making uh, this movie of this, this beautiful, tender romance set in the Gilded Age? And then you watch it and you hear Martin Scorsese talk about it, and he's always called it his most violent film. And I agree with it 100% because the violence that's in The Age of Innocence is not about blood or bullets. It's about the cruelty with which people treat each other. And, you know, it's about two people who have such a desire for each other and such a love for each other, but they are torn apart just, just because, just because society said. By 2003, with 17 movies behind him, Scorsese was now seen as one of the greatest directors in the world. And whilst he hadn't yet been rewarded with an Oscar for his work, in 2003 he finally got a place on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. The name Martin Scorsese was now cemented in cinematic history. Now, I was there when you got your star on the Walk of Fame yesterday. Does that mean you've made it? Uh, <laughs> No, I, no I, I guess, uh, I, I don't know if you're always in the process of making it. I mean, it's more about what you, it's really how you feel about yourself and how you feel about each film that you make. Uh -huh. I think that's what you got to live with yourself. If you feel this is the best I can do under the circumstances or if I'm satisfied or not satisfied, sometimes you make a film, you don't even know what to think of it, mm -hmm. you know? And I think for, the, for me, the star, and I have the name there as my parents would have loved it. Mm -hmm. My mother and father would have really loved that. And that's one of the reasons why it was kind of fun. I want to ask you about the movie. What impressed you most about the piece of history you're telling in Gangs of New York? Um, 
it's really the formation of a, of a, of a, of a, of a new country, in a way. Uh, the experiment of a country that's dealing with multicultures and different religions, different ethnic groups, all trying to live together in the same city, uh -huh. which is quite unique, I uh -huh. think, and, uh, and in history. And uh, it's the formation of that, and it's an honesty. We tried to be as honest as possible mm -hmm. with the nature of the way people behaved at that time, what they felt, uh -huh. um, and not, not deal with the, anything being somewhat politically correct, but, but trying to hit it pretty much on the head. Really cool. uh, oh, and sorry. it's basically, it's a film that uh, also comes out of the streets where I grew up, too. You know how I stayed alive this long, all these years? Fear. The spectacle of fearsome acts. If somebody steals from me, I cut off his hands. He offends me, I cut out his tongue. The release of Gangs of New York coincided with his Walk of Fame honor. The film was the start of Scorsese's professional relationship with Leonardo DiCaprio who, for the next 20 years, would become a mainstay in the director's movies in a way that mirrored his previous relationship with De Niro. For many, this was the start of a new era for both DiCaprio and Scorsese. Could you have made it without Leonardo? I don't know. I don't know. Probably not. Probably not. My old friend Mike Ovitz uh, stopped by one day in 1999 and said, why don't we do Gangs New York? Uh, I said, I got, I'm forming a new management company. I have a young new actor, Leo DiCaprio. And I said, well, that's fantastic because he's a great actor and maybe have the ability. It turned out that Leo liked my films, too. So he promised to stay on board. Following Gangs of New York, DiCaprio appeared in five Scorsese films, including The Departed in 2007. The film, which was a return to similar themes Scorsese was well known for, crime, corruption, and mob violence, finally won the 65-year-old director his first Oscar. And on the night... It was his old movie Brett colleagues who presented him with the award. When your name was called, was the, is the word finally is what popped into your mind? It's a good question. I, uh, finally, it, it, um, I kept saying, I told Leslie outside, I said, you know, good thing I didn't get it before. It's a good thing I waited and good thing, I, you know, yeah, because maybe, maybe it would have changed the kind of movies I made or something. I couldn't trust myself. I don't know if I was strong enough if I had gotten it before, quite honestly. You know, and I'm glad that it went this way. And when I saw that smile on, on his face, uh, Stephen's face, I said, oh, you know, <laughs> something's up, <laughs> you know. But I'm glad, I'm glad, I'm glad it's taken this long. It's been worth it. Scorsese's next big success came in the form of The Wolf of Wall Street in 2013. The story of Jordan Belfort, a greedy Wall Street stockbroker, struck a chord with people around the world. Once again, Scorsese cast DiCaprio in the lead role as Belfort, continuing their strong working relationship. Everybody have a good week? For me, the character uh, represents or actually behaves in a, in, a, in a way which is fascinating to me because it's, it's a, a mindset that um, is ruthless and uh, uh, literally, I think, uh, at a certain point, and it's very early in his life, uh, he is able to, uh, uh, he's able to command millions of dollars by one or two phone calls. And uh, this eliminates any aspect of morality. The whole moral landscape is gone, and uh, there are no restrictions. There are no restrictions, even uh, legally. There were no restrictions. And so he's able to uh, run rampant. There's something about the story that The Wolf of Wall Street was telling that, you know, this book had come out exposing how the entirety of America had been scammed, basically. And there was an anger behind that. And I, I think Scorsese being able to capture that anger and channeling it into a movie that also brought all the vitality and energy of the Goodfellas into that arena, like created this perfect storm of, of just like Americana. Like it's one of the most American movies I've ever seen in my life. It's sort of surprisingly controversial for Scorsese's filmography. 
I love that it is the film with the most amount of F-bombs. In terms of like narrative feature films, it's the one with the absolute most. I think there's around like 500 instances. Fuck, fucking, fucking, motherfucking, fucking, fucking, 30,000 fucking dollars in one fucking month. Well, that's the way they speak. Nearly 25 years after their last collaboration, De Niro and Scorsese joined forces again in 2019 to tell the story of The Irishman. The four-hour epic was released on Netflix, marking a new era for streaming and movies. For Scorsese, using Netflix allowed him the scope to do exactly what he wanted with the film with total creative control. I think Scorsese's relationship with modern American cinema is an interesting one on a lot of levels. I mean, he's had success in the 2000s and the 2010s, most obviously with The Wolf of Wall Street. But I guess with something like The Irishman, he's making fairly traditional Scorsese fare in a way, you know. And it's not just that he's pulling together the old team of actors who've been in so many of his previous movies and that it's, OK, mild, perhaps more mildly, but it's still a gangster film to one degree or other. Put him on the phone, let you talk to him, OK? Right. Hello? Is that Frank? Yes. Hiya, Frank. This is Jimmy Hoffa. Yeah, yeah. Glad to meet you. Well, glad to meet you, too, even if it's over the phone. And, and, and I suppose that then begs the question, you know, should somebody, again, who's pretty much an octogenarian now, should they be doing films that are, you know, attractive to 20-year-olds who want to come to the cinema and watch their movies? Maybe, to, to some degree. I mean, after all, the culture demands that wherever you are, whatever journey in life or whatever stage of your career, you should be able to attract a, a wide scope and audience. So I think, on, you know, on one level, Scorsese is making movies for himself. On another level, to find an audience making those kind of films still after such a long career is testimony to his ambition still his ability and still his desire to do a great body of work. And I think that's, you know, you can, you, when most people are way past retirement, you can ask for a little more, can you? Scorsese's pursuit to continue telling important stories about American history continued in 2023. His film, Killers of the Flower Moon, tells the devastating story of the Osage murders. And for the first time, Scorsese cast both De Niro and DiCaprio together in what felt like a culmination of every film that's come before. It's supposed to be a suicide, you dumb bell. You didn't tell him to leave the gun. I don't know why I told him to leave the gun. I told, I told him, exactly. him to leave the gun. Just like you I told him, kid. I don't know why he didn't. I don't know why. I told him just like you told him. You told him to do it in the front of the head, and why did he do it in the back? It's of you not to sit still, to always push yourself. Oh, no, no, I always, I mean, the point is it's so hard. Look at what you're doing. It's very hard work. You have to really want to do it, I think. Um, and so uh, to be um, uh, on a movie set or on a location, uh, to be dealing with all the issues that, well, that are involved in production, I think it's something that you have to really feel strongly about and that you want to say, that you're sort of burning to say. And so that, that keeps you going. If you get the actors with you and a DP and the rest of your crew, that's on a mission with you, that's good. So I've been lucky. There's definitely been a slowdown in the amount of movies that Scorsese makes, which, you know, partially, yeah, he's older, he's got a family, he's got other stuff to be worrying about. But at the same time, it is becoming increasingly harder for Scorsese to make the, the kinds of movies that Scorsese wants to make. So I, I don't know if he's going to continue to make movies at the same pace, but I think maybe we'll consider him more as a sort of caretaker of cinema. Now, I, you know, I've been blessed to be, I've been blessed to have been able to make some interesting pictures over the, over the years. But it's true that I keep learning from the pictures I know. And at the same time, I'm excited by many of the new pictures being made here. But I'm also concerned. I'm almost very concerned about the way that people are seeing movies. 
Now look, I know the business has changed and everything changes all the time. Impermanence, that's what it's about. It's wide open though now. You can watch everything, anytime, anywhere. And it puts a burden on you, on the viewer. You know, not all changes are, for, are all for the good. And I just feel that we might be tilting the scales away from that creative viewing experience and away from, away from movies as an art form. You know, all I can say is that while the art, of course, can't survive without the business, I have to say that in the end, the business certainly isn't going to survive without the art, which is made by people with something to say. We, we you know, we can't have a future of our art form without knowing its past.